Well, I just want to thank Scotty and his colleagues. It's certainly true that you guys are a lot nicer to look at than the microfilm they're usually helping me find. And, you know, that's old issues of the Alex City Outlook, the Dadeville Record, you know, the Montgomery Advertiser. If there was newsprint in Alabama, they've got it and they'll help you find it. So when you're doing a book like this, you you really rely on librarians and archivists and you know they know their corners of the world and I, I couldn't have written this book without the archives so it's it's really special for me to be here on the day it comes out and I don't think Norwood is here but Norwood Kerr could help you find a court case if it happened in the 19th century the 20th century or yesterday and he came up with some of the records that made the book possible so I just I want to thank him and, and Scotty in particular and you're also lucky, you know, you get me, but you get me if you go to any of these book talks. You guys are truly lucky. You get Jim Earnhardt if you've had a chance to read the book. He's one of the reporters who covered this case for the Alex City Outlook, and he had a very long friendship with Harper Lee, so you, you, you meet him in the first section of the book, but he comes back, and we've got some of the Radney family here as well, and one of Tom's daughters is here, so I'd encourage you, you know, I learned all this stuff through book learning, but but they're here and they lived it. So if you have a chance to talk to them after the talk, they know every bit as much as I do, if not more. And it goes without saying that in a room this size, you guys all probably knew either Harper Lee or Tom Radney or the Reverend or all three of them. So we're going to do a Q&A at the end, and I hope you'll share any stories you have or ask any questions that you, you think I might be able to answer. But I just want to thank you for coming. And you, you might have already read about the book, but in case you haven't, um, Scotty gave it a pretty good introduction. It's, it's, it's basically three portraits of three very different lives in Alabama, and the first is the Reverend Willie Maxwell. And he, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about his upbringing and read you a tiny bit from his section, um, but he was accused of murdering five family members, and in the course of that criminal litigation, and along with some civil litigation, the nature of which I'll tell you more about in a minute, um, he was represented by a man named Tom Radney, a lawyer over in Alex City, and Tom had had a pretty incredible political career before he went back to small town lawyering. So. The section about Tom takes you through kind of mid-century Alabama politics and lands you right back in Alex City, which is where he was practicing when he crossed paths with the Reverend. And they meet Harper Lee in 1977 when the Reverend is gunned down at the funeral of his last victim. And she hears about this story, takes an interest, comes to town, and starts doing everything that she had done with Truman Capote in Kansas. And starts getting records, starts doing interviews, and plans to write a book about the case. So I'll, I'll read you a tiny bit of her section, um, which has as, to my mind, one of the great characters of the book, and I had the chance to interview her. I didn't have the chance to meet her in person. We talked by, by phone, and a lot of you in this room probably know her, too, and you'll see she just lands on the page the same way she landed in my ear, and if you ever met her, it's Marianne Pittman Allen, and she was quite a character, so I'll read just a little bit from this section about Harper Lee, too, and hopefully that'll give you a sense of how the book works, and, um, and then leave it open for Q&A. So I said the, the first part is about the Reverend, and I'm going to take you through. He's born in 1925, and the, the very opening of the book is about the um, creation of Lake Martin. And if you like John McPhee, that part of the book kind of works that way. I'm telling you about how the Tallapoosa River was dammed, and I just fell in love with Lake Martin, and I got very interested in the natural history. I just think you all have such a beautiful state that I had to tell the rest of the world about it. So we, we get a little bit of Lake Martin, and then we plop down with the Reverend. Willie Maxwell and his siblings were born in Kellington, one of those mapped out towns just west of Alex City, and raised in Cruzville, an unincorporated community too tiny to even count as a village, only a few homes, a couple of stores, and at least that many churches since white and black believers required separate sanctuaries, and the Methodists and Baptists wouldn't worship together either. There was traffic, but it never did more than pass through. In those days, it consisted mostly of horses and mule teams, though a few Model Ts found their way over from the Walker Ford Company in the next county. And the horns were loud enough that when they did, it made some of the people and most of the livestock jump. When the trains began coming through, children learned to recognize the different locomotives by the sound of their whistles. Otherwise, it was so quiet in that part of Alabama that you could hear the bird song all morning and bullfrogs all night. There were only 1,200 people in the whole of Coosa County at the time, and enough pine trees that a boy playing Tarzan could practically swing from one end of it to the other without touching the ground. What little crime there was ran to bigamy, bastardy, hoboing, failing to honor the Sabbath, and using vulgar language in front of women. So, you know, the Reverend has what, what might be, for some of you, a very familiar rural childhood, and 
then he did what a, a lot of young men, black and white, at that time did. He was he registered for the draft and he served in World War II. And um, he actually had a very distinguished career in the Army. And he came back, you know, he was promoted to sergeant, got a good conduct medal. And in January 1947, he comes home back in Coosa County. Maxwell settled in Kellington, the town where he was born. Now 21 years old, he was almost 6 feet 2 and 180 pounds, tall enough to see over almost any man and slim enough to pass between any two of them. His brown eyes were always watchful, his face handsome and lean. A narrow mustache sat like an officer's chevron above his lips. His speech was elegant, almost formal, and the charm most young men could spare only for their studies he offered to anyone he met leaving sirs and ma'ams like fingerprints wherever he went. There wouldn't be anybody nicer to you, conversation-wise, people said. You'd think that man came from heaven, he was so smooth. Sometime after his return home, Maxwell traded his uniform for a job with the company that had made it, Russell Manufacturing, Alexander City's largest textile mill. The handsome young army vet also met a quiet local girl named Mary Lou Edwards. Born and raised in Cottage Grove, another one of Coosa County's tiny towns, Mary Lou was two years younger than Willie and still living with her parents when he gave her an engagement ring. They got their medical certificate the last week of March and were married at the probate court in the county seat of Rockford on April 2, 1949. It was the first but not the last marriage of the future Reverend Willie Maxwell. And whatever else can be said about it, this much is true. It lasted as he promised that day it would, until death did them part. So that's the, the kind of cliffhanger of the Reverend's young life. And again, if you've read anything about the book, you know that um, not only was the Reverend's first wife murdered, but his second wife was as well. And a brother, a nephew, and a stepdaughter died under similarly suspicious circumstances. Um, and one part of the book reckons with the kind of response of the community around Lake Martin to these suspicious or, you know, unaccounted for deaths and the inability of the police to do anything about it. So he was tried for the murder of his first wife, but not convicted. And in some of the subsequent deaths, there, there wasn't even a proper finding of the cause of death. And so if you know anything about this case, and some of you might have lived through this period of Alabama's history, it was actually covered as the death of the voodoo priest. And those voodoo rumors really, really started to take hold um, after after the second wife died. And to my mind, one of the most interesting kind of bits of research I got to do was around voodoo. And so I'm just going to read you a tiny bit of that too, because I think some of you were there yesterday when I read in um, Birmingham. And I'll give you something new, so you don't you haven't heard it all before. <laughs> It's also just interesting, and again, some of you might have grown up with these kinds of beliefs or, or read more about, you know, when Zora Neale Hurston or Carl Carmer came through to do this kind of folklore research. So the, the, the book draws on a lot of that, that early um, scholarship. Whether or not the Reverend Willie Maxwell was actually a voodoo priest, he lived in a community willing to believe that he was. Plenty of good Christians in Coosa County shook out their pillows at night and scrubbed their steps in the morning to fend off spirits and spells warned their children that the hoodoo man would get them if they stayed out too late, and told their spouses that they would lay a trick on them if they did not stop drinking or lying or lying about drinking. <laughs> Coincidence just wasn't a word that rolled off tongues in Alabama as easily as conjuring. So when Willie Maxwell was acquitted of murdering his first wife and remarried the young widow of his conveniently deceased neighbor, a lot of people were convinced that he used voodoo to fix the jury, put death on his neighbor's trail, and charm a much younger woman. Maybe Maxwell had burned a court case candle or used law stay away oil. Perhaps he had nailed a photograph of Abram Anderson, that's the husband of the soon-to-be second wife, to the north-facing side of a tree and added another nail every morning for nine mornings until the man weakened and died. As for Dorcas Anderson, well, maybe he had sprinkled wishing oil on a sample of her handwriting, worn it for nine days by his heart, and then buried it under his front steps. However unlikely such theories might seem, they were more comforting than the alternative. For many of the Reverend's neighbors, it was better to believe that, in the face of conjuring, there was nothing that law enforcement and the judicial system could do than to believe that in the face of terrible crimes, they had not done enough. Supernatural explanations flourish where law and order fails. Which is why, as time passed and more people died, the stories about the Reverend grew stronger, stranger, and if possible, more sinister. The most widespread one began like a fairy tale, with seven sisters and seven brothers. 
Willie Maxwell, people said, was the seventh son of a seventh son, a numerological curiosity that meant he had been born with power over life and death. To augment this natural gift, he supposedly went down to New Orleans to study voodoo with the Seven Sisters, a fearsome septet well known throughout the South. I went to New Orleans, Louisiana, one blues song began, just on account of something I heard. The Seven Sisters told me everything I wanted to know, and they wouldn't let me speak a word. After the sisters help the singer, someone recognizes his new powers and tells him, go devil and destroy the world. Although their history and even their existence is disputed, stories about the sisters have circulated since the 20s. They were said to be clairvoyant, ageless, and available to sell their blessings, curses, candles, and potions to anyone who came calling at their seven identical dwellings on Coliseum Street in the Garden District. Out-of-state license plates were always pulling up there, and people came and went at all hours of the day and night. Some of the visitors were just customers, but others were disciples, including, supposedly, one lean, elegant, well-dressed man from Coosa County. Never mind that the Reverend Willie Maxwell actually had just four brothers, plus four numerologically inconvenient sisters. The rumors about him grew taller than Loblolly Pines. He hung white chickens upside down from the pecan trees outside his house to keep away unwanted spirits, painted blood on his doorsteps to keep away the authorities. He carried envelopes filled with deadly powders. He had a whole room at home just for voodoo, lined with jars labeled love, hate, friendship, and death. If he got sick, he drank someone else's blood to feel better. Drive by his front door and the headlights of your car would go dark. Say a crossword against him and he'd lay a trick on you. Look him in the eye and he'd curse you forever. He could move faster than was humanly possible, traveling the 150 miles from Birmingham to Atlanta in 20 minutes. When he needed to vanish quicker than that, though, he could turn into a black cat. So, you know, again, what's interesting about that is those rumors persisted into Harper Lee's reporting time, and I just died the day someone told me, and then it was confirmed by someone else that she, she, she loved cats, and she actually took in a stray cat while she was living around Lake Martin, and she took to calling it the Reverend, <laughs> because she had been told about that rumor. And um, if you read the New York Times piece, Michael Lewis has already spoiled it for you, but she found no evidence of the voodoo being substantiated. It was just you know, kind of the way I've represented it. It's just an interesting way of talking about how people experience these crimes. But, um, I told you a little bit about Tom Radney, and again, a lot of you probably remember when, when Tom was in the state legislature and he ran for lieutenant governor, and you know, he had a persistent presence in democratic politics around the state, so he's quite well known for that, but I just want to read you a, a tiny bit of um, his section builds to the trial of the vigilante. So he not only represented the reverend, he represented the man who, who shot the reverend too, and um, I'm just going to pick up with, so Tom has agreed to take this case, and what you need to know is, um, you know, Tom by this point is well known as a trial lawyer, and, you know, he's he's in a little bit of a bind, and I know there's some lawyers in the room, because I see Mr. Dees right here, and, you know, you, you, you know long shot cases, and so, so here's Tom, and he's taking this case, and there are 300 witnesses, any one of whom could be subpoenaed as a witness to this murder. Burns has confessed not just once, but twice, once in the chapel, once on the way to the... Uh, police station, so here's poor poor Tom figuring out what he's going to do. And this is the summer of 77. In the weeks after Maxwell's funeral, the temperature in Alexander City barely fell below 100 degrees. June's hot spell turned to July's heat wave. The hay fields that generally had two cuttings by midsummer hadn't yet had one. Cotton was a third of its usual height. The corn had dried up entirely, and most of the soybean crop hadn't even been sown. Dust devils swirled along the sides of the highways. The sun rose up every morning into an already smoldering day, scorched everything beneath it, and set into a stifling night. Clouds occasionally formed and threatened, but the rains never came. By the third week of July, the drought was so severe that President Carter declared both Coosa County and Tallapoosa County, not to mention the rest of Alabama and Georgia, disaster areas. The heat that summer made the farmers crazy, and made the loggers crazy, made the mill workers crazy, basically made everyone crazy except the Iceman and the kids down in Lake Martin, which is how one day Big Tom settled on his defense of Robert Burns. In the middle of July, when Burns was indicted by a grand jury in Tallapoosa County, he did as Radney told him and pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. Then Burns walked out of the courthouse in blue bib overalls and a Caterpillar baseball cap on a $10,000 bond. Insanity isn't an easy thing to prove, and it is often the defense of last resort. The belief that madness can be exculpatory is an ancient one. 
so ancient that it was carved into the code of, code of Hammurabi 1,700 years before the birth of Christ, alongside the notion of proportional retaliation, lex talionis, an eye for an eye. But by the time Tom Radney had invoked it, the insanity defense had been out of favor for a century. Queen Victoria had tried to stifle it in the mid-19th century out of fear that it would encourage would-be assassins. A hundred years later, President Richard Nixon tried to have it outlawed too. Too many defendants had turned out to be insane only until acquittal, and prosecutors and psychiatrists alike had come to worry that the defense was just a way of letting murderers get away with murder. Around the country, there were examples of defendants sent to state mental hospitals after a jury decided they were insane, only to have the hospital superintendent and staff release them after diagnosing them as sane. In response, some states, Idaho, Kansas, Montana, and Utah, banned the insanity plea entirely, but Alabama still allowed it, and Big Tom decided it was his best bet. In reality, it was probably his only bet. <laughs> his client had brought a pistol into a chapel, shot a man three times in front of hundreds of people, then confessed to the police not once but twice before the body of his victim had even grown cold. A first-year law student could have successfully prosecuted the case in his sleep. Tom's opposing counsel in the murder trial of Robert Burns was not a first-year law student, to put it mildly. By the time the trial started, Thomas F. Young had already served 16 years as a district attorney and was just starting a fresh six-year term. He too went by Tom, and he was said to have tried more criminal cases than any other DA in Alabama history. He also had something to prove when it came to the Maxwell case. He'd been the district attorney who failed to bring timely charges against the Reverend in the death of his first wife. He and Tom had faced off in 50 or so other murder trials, and although both men had respected records, they had very different styles. Radney is silk and young as sandpaper, Alvin Ben wrote in the Alexander City Outlook. Ben was a man well acquainted with contrasts, a Jewish reporter raised in Pennsylvania Amish country who came south to cover the civil rights movement and stayed to raise a family. He'd listen nervously as KKK members denounced Zionist Jews at a rally, but then took him out drinking after and he'd interviewed the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. and the police commissioner Bull Connor for the same story. But even Ben had seldom seen two men diverge as dramatically as the two Toms. Young wasn't about to lose a murder case when he had hundreds of witnesses, and Radney wasn't about to lose a case when the whole state and half the nation was watching. Despite what pop boilers and Perry Mason would lead you to believe, Alvin Ben said, most trials resemble warmed up grits and it takes some doing to stay awake. But the Burns case was bound to be different. So that's the first two thirds of the book, and it really is, you know, all around Lake Martin, and it's taking you through the Reverend and Tom Radney. And of course, I think for a lot of readers, you're you're itching to get to chapter 15, which is called Disappearing Act, and you'll you'll learn why in a minute. And I'm I'm sure you're wondering at this point, she's going to read us a whole chapter. It's got to be so long. She's already read so much, but it's quite short. And again, I, I've let you know who you're going to meet. And she is such a tour de force that I just can't cut her short. So I'm, you're, you're going to meet her. And again, some of you probably know her. And f because it relies so strongly on the conversation we had, there's two curse words. So I just want to warn you that those are headed your way. It was the damnedest thing, but Marianne Pittman Allen couldn't find a copy of To Kill a Mockingbird anywhere in Washington. Mrs. James Browning Allen was the second wife of the junior senator from the great state of Alabama, and in that role she was expected not only to attend the ladies of the Senate luncheon, but to present the First Lady of the United States, Rosalind Carter, with a book representative of her home state. It was obvious to Alan which book she should bring, since there was no Alabama tale more famous than the one about the adventures of a tomboy named Scout and her heroic lawyer of a father, Atticus Finch. But even though there were millions of copies of Nell Harper Lee's novel in circulation at the time, Alan couldn't find a single one for sale in the nation's capital. Alan was Lee's age, and they had both dropped out of the University of Alabama around the same time. Lee had been a student at the law school and quit to write. Alan had been a journalism student and quit to have children. Her first marriage didn't take and she had three mouths to feed, so she began working as a reporter for a handful of newspapers around Birmingham. That's how she met her second husband, who was then Lieutenant Governor James Browning Allen, a widower with two children of his own. She heard church bells on, their way to, on the way to interview him for a story and hoped it wasn't a sign, but four months later they were married, and four years after that they were moving to Washington for him to take his seat in the United States Senate. Alan didn't like to make a big production out of her role as a lady of the Senate, but she also didn't want to embarrass her husband or her state, so she was determined to bring the perfect gift to Mrs. Carter. 
When she couldn't find the book, she went looking for its author. Alan knew that she and Lee had a mutual friend from their Tuscaloosa days, and she thought he might know how to get a hold of her. Nearly everyone in the state would have recognized John Forney's voice, and the half who were Alabama fans basically thought it was the voice of God. <laughs> Th that joke plays only in a room like this. The, everybody else in the country needs. Forty had been calling the play-by-play -play for the Crimson Tide for over a decade. John, Alan said when the sportscaster answered, do you know where Nell Lee is? I've simply got to find a copy of her book. After she explained why, Forney told her that Lee was in Alexander City. Alan knew Alex City well. Her first husband had been born and raised there. In the years when her own father was building levees on the Mississippi River and living with her mother in a tent on its banks, her ex-father-in-law had been hobnobbing in the Alabama State Senate. After that, Jay Sanford Mullins had gone to Alex City to serve for more than three decades as the town's attorney. As best as Alan could remember, the most exciting thing that ever happened around Lake Martin was her father-in-law climbing into the bed of a truck to deliver one of his speeches, unfailingly fiery numbers that could draw an audience from three counties. But the oratorical wizard of Chanahatchee Creek had long since died, and she couldn't imagine what would entice a world-famous author to Tallapoosa County. What in the world, Alan asked Forney incredulously, is she doing in Alex City? Lee was there writing, Forney said. But if Alan could give him a little time, he would try and get in touch with her. A few hours later, Forney called back and said that he'd track Lee down at the Horseshoe Bend Motel. Maybe she knew it. It was that hexagon-shaped number out on 280. And that he had been given the go-ahead to give her the writer's private telephone number. It was like she was hiding behind damn trees down there, Alan remembers. But I got the secret number and we talked for over an hour. They talked about small town lawyers since Alan wondered if Lee knew anything about her ex-father-in-law. And they talked about journalism since Lee was a regular reader of Alan's syndicated column, Reflections of a News Hen. When Alan finally got around to asking why Lee was hanging her hat in Alex City, the author wouldn't say much. Just that she had been there for a few months, working on something that had to do with a voodoo preacher. Lee did say, though, that she would make sure a copy of her novel got to the nation's capital by May 15, 1978, in time for the luncheon. True to her word, Lee sent a first edition of her book, inscribed on the front page to Rosalind Carter, along with a verse from one of the hymns to wisdom in the book of Proverbs, her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. Mrs. Allen presented the book to Mrs. Carter at the Ladies of the Senate luncheon, which, as it happens, was the last of those Allen would ever attend. Two weeks later, after she and her husband had returned to Alabama for the summer recess, Senator James Browning Allen died of a heart attack at their beach house in Gulf Shores. Not long after that, Governor George Wallace appointed Marion Pittman Allen to her husband's seat, making her the state's second female senator. Overwhelmed both personally and professionally, she forgot all about the Pulitzer Prize winner holed up at the Horseshoe Bend Motel. It was easy enough to forget about Harper Lee in those days. To Kill a Mockingbird had come out 18 years before, and in all that time, Lee had published almost nothing else. Three short essays for two glossy magazines, two tiny profiles that were favors for her friend Truman Capote, one satirical recipe for cracklin' bread and a novelty cookbook. In nearly two decades, those were the only writings she had put into the world. No second novel had followed the first, and she hadn't given an interview in 14 years. The last time she had so much agreed to be quoted in print was another favor for Capote. In 1976, he had asked Lee to sit with him during an interview for People, which was running a profile of him. She had said a total of 12 words on the record, seven of which were, we are bound by a common anguish. To Kill a Mockingbird had made Lee extravagantly wealthy, but you wouldn't have known it to look around her life. When she was in New York, she lived in a small rent-controlled apartment on the Upper East Side. When she went back to Alabama, she stayed with one of her sisters in a modest brick ranch house in their hometown of Monroeville. No matter where she was, she avoided the press, her fans, and anything that seemed too literary. She tried to live her life as if she had never published one of the most popular novels in American history. In 1962, the year the film adaptation of her book came out, the one that earned Gregory Peck an Oscar and further fixed her portrait of a small southern town in the nation's collective memory, Lee told a reporter for the Mobile Register that she wanted to disappear, and she basically had. But now, alone in the middle of a hotel room, in the middle of nowhere, with the world no longer watching, she was nearly as free as she had been in the tiny flat where she had written To Kill a Mockingbird. 
That was what Lee chose not to tell Marion Pittman Allen that day on the telephone. Harper Lee was in Alexander City because finally, all these years later, she was going to write another book. So there you have it, your three characters, and again, three very different ways of you know growing up in Alabama and finding a way to make sense of the world. You've got a preacher, so I take you through a little bit of religious history. You've got a politician and a lawyer, so you get a little bit of legal history. And you know the great Harper Lee, so you can think about the way we tell stories about who we are and where we're from. So a, a look at the literary history of Alabama too. But um, that's all I have to read for you. I truly hope that you know there's plenty of time for for questions. Um, and I think I've agreed to stay close to the mic. So don't ask me anything so interesting that I start to like wander away from the podium. <laughs> Ever, yes, sir. Did she ever put pen and paper? So I think one of my favorite paragraphs in the book, and there's someone in this room who could participate in this speculation. I didn't. I didn't bring up um, Professor Nancy Anderson, who's here, who I think has done a little bit of sleuthing on her own. So in terms of people close to Lee, you have a camp of them who say, "No, it was a dark time in her life. She never wrote any of it." The Radney family has four pages, which seem to be a chapter. They also have a page of her notes, which correspond to the notes that she made in, in Kansas, identical to what she did for Truman Capote. If you go to the New York Public Library and you look, it's you know January 1978, she's sitting down to interview a sister of the first Mrs. Maxwell. On the far end of that camp of friends and familiars, there are people who say they talked to Louise, who had read the whole thing, and it was better than In Cold Blood. So on the far end of things, you've got people who insist she wrote a whole manuscript and either chose not to publish it because the publishers found it too racially scandalous, you know, it was a black serial killer in the 70s from the author of To Kill a Mockingbird, or, you know, there's some correspondence where she says the reverend had a living accomplice, so she told some people she was afraid of, you know, afraid for her safety and the safety of her family in town. Um, she had a niece whose husband owned the Horseshoe Bend Motel where she stayed for part of the time in town. So that far end of speculation says she wrote it but chose not to publish it. So it is truly, you know, it's not just a marketing ploy to say that it is unknown how much of this book she wrote. At the end of an exhaustive four-year investigation, I can't tell you for sure. If somebody in this room knows, they ought to stand up and tell us all. But um, when will we know, which is probably like a follow-up question to that one. Um, so she passed in 2016, and there is apparently a, a, an archive of sorts in Monroeville, which is all the materials she had in her apartment in New York and everything that her sister Alice had saved in Monroeville. And it's hard to know what's in that. You know, it, it's not just the Reverend. I, I quote a really beautiful letter from 1958 that she wrote to the couple who had given her the money to take time off to write To Kill a Mockingbird. And that is an incredible list of ambitions. You know, probably some of you have heard this quote where she wanted to be the Jane Austen of South Alabama. That list from 1958 is incredible. It's like she wants to write a Graham Greene novel. She wants to write a novel about the United Nations. She wants to write a novel about India 1910, this kind of inexplicable marker of Indian history where, you know, any of those could be manuscripts she started too. But in terms of the Reverend, I, I think, you know, when you get to that paragraph, You'll, you'll be equipped to make your own judgment. And it's been actually one of the most interesting things about the reviews of the book so far is the certainty with which reviewers tell people their own opinions. And having written the book, I can tell you the answer is not in the book. <laughs> but it has led to what, you know, there are headlines that are like, you know, the book she never wrote to the missing manuscript. So you can't say with certainty. Ghost Hatter Watchman. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's in Ursula K. Le Guin's review of Ghost Hatter Watchman. She speculates that uh, Lee had tried to write a, a very complex book about race in Ghost Hatter Watchman and had, and had failed. That book sort of more or less unsuccessful. And had kind of sold out and effectively and written a sort of fairy tale about race mm -hmm. in, in To Kill a Mockingbird. And Le Guin sort of speculates that that's why Lee sort of retreated from, from the literary world because she felt sort of ashamed with her. And it's based, I mean, it's not historical, it's just sort of, she's spinning a, 
align. But I, but I've always found that quite interesting, and it seems to bear on both what you were just saying and on the whole idea of your book. I mean, do, do you did you find anything to suggest that Lee was trying to sort of capture a complexity that she did not capture in To Kill a Mockingbird? Sure, absolutely. I mean, I think very straightforwardly, aside from the Aside from the biographical reasons, she might not have been able to finish a book like this. Um, I think there are thematic reasons, and I'm not sure if you all know the, the writer being referenced here, but Ursula Le Guin is an extraordinary and actually quite prolific novelist. Um, so she would know from productivity. <laughs> um, so, right, not based on a historical argument about Lee, but a speculative argument about writers in general. And she's not misinformed. Um, one chapter of this book goes through, there's a lot of interesting new correspondence that um, Lee's publishers let me look at. And that is back and forth between her agent and her editor and between Lee and those people and a little bit of triangulation with some friends of hers at the time. So what most of you probably know know is Ghost at a Watchman was a draft manuscript she completed in 1958 and then she commenced a process of revision to create To Kill a Mockingbird and draft is too strong a word because actually they're very distinctive manuscripts um, and it's it's kind of a tricky thing to describe because she's making use of the same characters, she's making use of the same fictional universe, but she was, with the help of an editor, really structuring different plots. Um, and so that's why Ghost at a Watchman, which feels so much like a sequel when we read it because the characters are aged up, is actually a manuscript that predates To Kill a Mockingbird. And in fact, she does express a lot of frustration um, with the kind of ethical advice she was getting from her editor. And they had some differences of not only political persuasion, but geographic background. And I think fairy tale might be too strong a word, but something like a palliative story about race relations is probably a, a little softer. And she and that editor, a woman named Tay Hohoff, really went back and forth. And it's part of the reason the revision process was so long. It's why Mockingbird didn't just walk out the door of Lippincott and, you know, it wasn't published after they bought it. It was this back and forth and because of the, some of the correspondence we can now see it's it's incredibly revealing about um, just how strongly they disagreed in the ways they went back and forth now I would say that you know along with Maxwell Perkins and you know Thomas Wolfe or someone this is one of the great editorial relationships of American literature because I think we would all agree that To Kill a Mockingbird is a better aesthetic novel even if it's a less complicated political novel um, so I, I hope that you, you might well enjoy that chapter I hope it's not boring for other folks who just want to know you know get, skip past this you know editing but but it's important I think for the Maxwell case because quite strongly she was dissatisfied with with some of the changes she was encouraged to make and I think it explains why she was interested in a more complicated story about race relations. Um, now again to go back to Ursula Le Guin's point, am ambition is not always matched by output and I, I think your ambitions can sometimes lead you to pursue a story that maybe you're not the best match for. And I, I, I don't think she would be wrong in speculating that that might have been one of the points of friction for working on The Reverend. But again, I promise the book is not so speculative. That's really me riffing on something where I'm quite scrupulous in the book not to, not to guess. But that, the correspondence that I quote is very interesting. With all of your research on Harper Lee, you consider, are you considering doing a biography? Oh, gosh. Well, there is a biography of Harper Lee. Um, that came out in 2006 by a man named Charles Shields who has written a, written biographies of a lot of American writers and Harper Lee was alive and well enough at that time to basically discourage every friend and family member from cooperating at all and I've never had so much sympathy for a fellow researcher than when I found some of the letters where she's writing to friends to say like I'll cut you out if you tell him anything and you know she describes him as Miss Marple like digging through her life and so it's it's actually despite her best effort a, a good kind of plot of her life and it only goes so far he revised it um, after Go Set a Watchman came out but um, I don't think that's a project for me although I, I think her estate is looking to do an authorized biography and um, that will probably build off that archive whenever it's unsealed so I think that that will be a very interesting book with whatever additional materials emerge but I'll tell you you know that Marion Pittman Allen story you know I just read aloud, 
but for the grace of God, I got to talk to her. And I think that, you know, the, the longer that biography is sort of in process, the, the, the fewer people you'll have to talk to who actually knew her and who have stories about growing up in Monroeville and that sort of thing. So if you know anyone who knew her or knew her at the University of Alabama or here at Huntington, just encourage them to write that stuff down. Because whether that biography, you know, someone will be chosen to do that. And I, one of my favorite pieces of source material for the books of women who died in the 80s, but who um, had a house on South Alabama Avenue with the Lees, and one of her grandsons had her write down an oral history, or I guess he recorded her and then typed it up, and it's just tremendous. You know, it's it's really a rich, it's, it's a rich history, and, you know, she remembers when Nell Harper was coming home from New York to take care of her daddy and working on the book, and it's just full of the kinds of details a biographer, you know, five or ten years from now would die for. So if you know anybody like that, you know, you don't have to share it with the likes of me, but just make sure you've written it down or encourage the, the person you know to, because the, the state is probably, I think that'll be the next biography of her, and um, as it is, I feel like I've already written too much about Harper Lee. <laughs> Yes, sir. Um, did Harper Lee actually get out and do field work beyond the hotel, going around the area, like Mark and all of that? Yeah, I mean, again, I would encourage you to take advantage of Ellen Radney sitting right there who can tell you about the time she met her. <laughs> so she was over to the Radney house and in the Radney law firm, and I mentioned that page in notes where she's going to interview Mary Lou Maxwell, the first Mrs. Maxwell's family in Cottage Grove, and um, she interviewed some of the law enforcement officers as well. Robert Burns, the vigilante who murdered the Reverend, is still alive and can recount in, in great detail the two times she came to his house. And in addition to all of that, there's the kind of, you know, document-based research and reporting um, hauntingly similar to what I had to do in 2015 to rebuild this case. She's getting court records. You know, there are photostatic copies where she's doing the kind of microfilm routine of looking into Radney's early political career and the ongoing litigation of the Maxwell case. And she, um, one of my favorite kind of documentary pieces of, of her reporting is the um, hymnal from when she went to the church of the man who gave the eulogy for the reverend stepdaughter. So is she getting around town? You know, she's going to a random church service so she can go talk to that preacher about the eulogy he gave two years before. So she really did scoot around town and that, that kind of concentrated year of research is really, you know, gumshoe reporting. And the, the, that's all kind of condensed into one chapter of the book, but I give you a little bit of a sense of kind of how the writing for her went, because the truth is it seems like the social aspects of reporting were really good for her, and the people who met her just can regale you with, you know, stories of how gregarious she was and friendly she was and what a good conversationalist she was. She just seems to have struggled with the writing side of the book. But yes, I mean, much more than just kind of, you know, reading research, a lot of reporting too, which again corresponds to what she did in Kansas. Same thing, you go and you talk to people in Garden City and they remember the day she came by. <laughs> you know, she made more of an impression. Capote left an impression, but she made more of an impression. <laughs> so. I yes. think we're all delighted that you have done this book. This is the book that uh, the... Harper Lee Estate was sort of looking for for a long time, and uh, the the story within the the small part of Monroeville that's close to Harper Lee said that um, a woman contacted uh, Miss Alice many years ago or some years ago and asked about uh, information on the the Reverend book, and uh, that Miss Alice said, "Well, she's no longer interested in doing that." So she mailed all of the file that Nail had uh, to a person and uh, made uh, no notation of, of who she mailed it to. Were you that person? No. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, look, you, you can get really in the weeds of this book, and I'll tell you, there's one writer in this book, and it's Harper Lee. It's not Casey Sepp, so I don't regale you with my reporting stories, but it's a little bit of a canard. So in... I tell the story in the book of a woman who in 2009 went and um, she and her husband have a couple of kids and they went to buy an Encyclopedia Britannica in Alex City from the thrift store. And when she opened it to the Harper's Ferry page, there was a letter from Harper Lee. No, no kidding. Dated 1978. Um, Thanks so much for having me. Um, you know, I'll be coming back till doomsday working on this book. And she's thanking him because she's in town working on the Maxwell case. And the woman who found that letter 
wrote a letter to Alice, who, remember, was up in her own years by 2009, and what she says is, I think that my sister gave all her materials to a writer in residence at Auburn. Someone like Casey Sepp has to then go and look at every writer in residence at Auburn. <laughs> Half of them are dead, and you go and you contact you know, their second cousin who's the nearest descendant, or you go looking for their archives. And the, the writer in question was a novelist, probably some of you all read, Madison Jones. And Madison Jones, God bless him, was a dutiful archivist, and he gave all of his letters to Emory. And there's a beautiful letter in, in his archives from Harper Lee. It's 1987. She gives a thorough account of her work on the Maxwell case, but she doesn't give him any files. And in fact, he never pursues the case. So Alice was right to remember that a writer in residence had been in touch. And what her letter says is, you know, I know you called my sister Alice. So again, Alice has an incredible memory to have remembered in 1987 that somebody contacted her. But Harper Lee didn't give him any materials. And I didn't get to talk to Madison Jones, the novelist, but Madison Jones IV, who is his grandson, who is also a poet, um, went through his grandfather's things, and other than the letter, there, there were no other materials. And in fact, the very last page of the book, so I told you I'm not in the book. The truth is I'm in one page of the book. It's the epilogue, and um, I tell you what happened to Tom Radney's files, but you got to read the book. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I guess, you know, obviously Professor Flint didn't know her at the time she was doing this research. He met her in 1983 when she was giving the talk in Eufaula. Um, I got to interview him for the original reporting for The New Yorker and obviously read the letters they exchanged. And he's not the only person who heard her say, you know, oh, I'm worried about my niece who lives in town or I'm worried about my sister who lives in Eufaula. Um, she certainly told other people in town that was why she moved on or why she wasn't going to put the book out. Um, but having said that, by 1987, the Reverend's widow, who is, as best I can tell, the accomplice she had in mind, had already died. So she wasn't quite keeping up with the case enough for that to be a valid concern, nor were there any suspicious deaths after the Reverend's murder. So I'm not sure that I would take seriously that particular theory, although I think what Professor Flint writes about really convincingly in his letters collection is her general fear of fame, you know, not just around the Maxwell case, but in general in New York, the number of people who wanted to know Harper Lee or wanted something from her or who intended to stalk her or learn where she lived. So I think, you know, he writes very convincingly about that, but I don't think those fears are particular to the Maxwell case, nor is there any evidence um, that, that she did really face particular threats from anybody within the, the Maxwell story. But again, there's somebody here who wrote about the Reverend and his likely accomplices at the time of this case. And as best I know, Jim was also never under threat or duress from anybody related to the Maxwell case. You're not from around here. <laughs> um, True story. <laughs> that's not a southern accent. Right. Uh, you went to Harvard. You didn't, you know, well, you, people from you, Alabama go to Harvard, too. Yes, I know. <laughs> but you're not from Alabama. Right. How did you land on this as a topic for a book? Sure. Well, I, I have good news for you, which is that people outside of Alabama read Harper Lee. Uh, she's well known, um, and I saw To Kill a Mockingbird first as a kid, the film, when I was quite young, and uh, my mother read it to me after that because in a very classic childhood way, I looked a lot like Mary Badham, so I over-identified with that character and just came to love Scout. And my father is not a lawyer, but I worshipped my father, and it was a perfect fit. I was a nerdy tomboy. Perfect fit. So I had always loved To Kill a Mockingbird, and I had always wanted to see Monroeville. You know, I knew that the town she was born and raised in, not that, it was, not that the novel was autobiographical, but that there was a relationship between Monroeville and Maycomb, and I had wanted to see it. And when Ghost Had a Watchman was announced in 2015, I came down to do some reporting for The New Yorker because there was a tremendous amount of excitement about that book, but there was also a lot of curiosity about 
the provenance of the manuscript and the you know conditions under which it was being published. So I came down to work on that story, and at that time I got put in touch with the Radneys because they knew something. They had interacted with Harper Lee and her lawyer in the years since Big Tom Radney died in 2011. And you got to be a bad reporter when somebody is telling you on the phone about the voodoo preacher who their grandfather defended and then defended the man who shot him, where, you know, I am very interested in politics. And the more I got to know about Big Tom, he seemed like just as interesting a character as Harper Lee. And the more I learned about the Reverend from people like Jim and archival searches, like going through the Outlook and the Advertiser and realizing, you know, you could still get autopsy files from that time and you could get court case files from that time. And even though it was the 70s, there were enough people alive who could talk you through, you know, what happened then. It just seemed like, you know, I had written a short article for The New Yorker in 2015, but it seemed like there was enough material for a book. So that, that's what it grew out of was that reporting in 2015. But yes, I'm not from around here. <laughs> I, 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 can t I can tell you it's 11 hours to Alex City from where I live and 13 to Monroeville because I've done that drive many a time. So I am not from around here. You all could have done me the favor of like raising a Harper Lee in like Southern Virginia or something. It would have been easier for me to get back and forth. Thank you. Well, I should say again, there's probably people in this room I know. I didn't thank Penny Weaver, who's here. There's a beautiful photograph in the book of Harper Lee at the end of her life in the in the meadows that that Penny Weaver took. And truly, you know, I, I couldn't have asked for more help everywhere I went. Whether I was asking about Big Tom, again, Mr. Dees is here. You know, it's it's not every day you sit down with the head of the Southern Poverty Law Center and say, you know, tell me about Big Tom, and he says, well, I went to high school with his wife. What do you want to know? <laughs> So you guys live your history and you love it, and I know that you know places like the archives really preserve it. So it was it was a pleasure to spend so much time down here. Uh, what's behind the name, uh, the title, Fury? Oh, Furious. thank you very much. <laughs> I should preface this with my publishers basically told me to stop talking about it because it's never as compelling for an audience as it is for me. Um, but so I mentioned that Professor Flint met, met Harper Lee first in 1983 at a talk she gave in Eufaula. And she was a big fan of a historian you guys probably all read, but um, was not widely read at the time, Pickett, who wrote one of the earliest histories of Alabama. And what's interesting about his history, if you go and you read it, it ends right when most people in Alabama would say things were just getting started, which is to say statehood, the bicentennial we're celebrating. and. Harper Lee in that talk says that, you know, basically he stopped writing at the end of the Creek Wars and that he, he could not bring himself emotionally to go beyond the end of the Creek Empire, which ended in a few furious hours at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend. And I told you she was staying at the Horseshoe Bend Motel, and the first time I went to the battlefield, it just, it was clear to me that there was an emotional connection. You know, she's given that talk in 1983. She is deep in the well of trying to write this book, and she's been obviously thinking so much about the Tallapoosa River and this part of the state that I just found it so heartbreaking when she says, Pickett left his heart at Horseshoe Bend. And for me, there's a, there's a real resonance to that title because it's both the ambition she brought to this project and the kind of, you know, s seemingly sad end to it. Although, again, I hope I'm proven wrong and, you know, in two years we're all reading the Reverend. Did the experience of assisting Capote with his own blood and the lack of acknowledgement Capote supposedly gave her for her assistance on that project motivate her at all? <laughs> We're in the realm of speculation again, so I can only speak to what I've read in her correspondence. And um, so if you've read Professor Flint's book, there, there's a letter kind of describing her frustrations with Capote, but there's also there's about a half dozen letters at Yale University that she exchanged with Capote's fact checker at The New Yorker, and those are pretty revealing. Um, and, you know, that's the fact checker who, like Harper Lee, was in a position to know what was true, what was false, and what was utter fabrication. And you can guess about the proportions of those things in In Cold Blood, which is a beautiful book, but which she had ethical objections to in terms of its um, accuracy. Um, so there's there's no direct correspondence. You know, she doesn't declare, you know, in, in bold typeface, I am going to write In Cold Blood, but true. <laughs> but there is, you know, there there is the insinuation in the way she talked about the case and in related correspondence to In Cold Blood that, that her project 
was in some ways, you know, the antidote to in cold blood. And, and certainly, you know, again, this kind of magnificent page of notes where it's January 12th, 1978. She's setting a scene of Mary Lou Maxwell's sister, Lena Martin and Essex Martin, and she's recording bits of the dialogue and she's telling a little bit about their house. And that is just perfect template for what she did in Kansas. So I, I think that that to me is the kind of beautiful symmetry of these two projects. And in a lot of ways, again, to get back to her ambition as a writer and, and the kinds of stories, complicated stories she wanted to tell about race, In Cold Blood is, is a kind of white horror story. It's, you know, a family murdered in their home by total strangers. It's not statistically, it's terrifying, and I don't want to diminish that, but it's not statistically signif significant in terms of crime. That's not how most people die. And in this case, she's looking at victims of domestic violence. She's looking at, you know, marginally poor women of color. And those are the representative murder victims in this country. So I think even in choice of subject, she's doing something a little different than, than he did in, in Cold Blood. Harder, truly harder, but, but ambitious. We want to thank you all for coming out tonight. We still have copies of the book. Thank you very much for coming.